everyone, Cleo here and today we're going over my April TBR. Now April has been a month that I've kind of been planning for a long time, since April last year. And it's gone through many changes <laughs> over the year in the sense that it no longer really resembles my original plan. But so basically in April quite a few people do something called Vida or Bida, like a book every day of the month of April or a video every day of the month of April and so I originally wanted to do a book every day of the month of April and I was thinking like okay Japanese literature has quite a lot of short books so in April 2022 I will just like read a Japanese novel a day that was the original plan like okay I won't have reached your TBR by April and I think it will kind of stress me out to do a month like this, a month in which I'm reading a book every single day of the month um, while I'm still going through a Project Zero TBR. So maybe I'll just make it 15, you know, a book every other day. But then as we got closer and closer to April, I was starting to think like, but yeah, I won't be making much process in my Zero TBR project that way because I only have two Japanese novels left on my TBR. So it'll just be like a month in which I make almost no progress in that. And I'm so focused on making progress in that project at this point in time that it just feels like it would just stress me out more if I took that. So in the end what I decided was I took a new look at my shelves, at what was remaining there, and I found out that there was actually a whole lot more translated literature still on there than what I thought was on there. So what I will be doing in the month of April is I will be reading the remaining translated works on my shelves. For translated works, I'm going to include everything that was not originally published in English. This is, of course, not the literal definition of translated fiction, but basically because of my channel being in English and because of the bookish industry as a whole being very much Anglo-Saxon English dominated, I consider translated fiction more of a term to refer to literature that's not coming from English speaking part of the world. And so all of these books will comply with that definition of translated fiction. Most of them will be in translation literally as well, but there are a few that I, for example, will be reading in the native language, but that's for an English speaking audience, they would need to seek a translation. Without further ado, let's just dive into the list and I'm going to start with the one exception to this month's reading list and that is The House of Always by Jen Lyons. This is the fourth book in A Course of Dragons. I have been reading the first three books in this over the first three months of the year and the fifth and final one in this series is coming out at the end of April and so I'm getting ready to continue on and finish up this series. This is an epic high fantasy series, it's very much more plot driven, that it's character driven. One of the main sort of like selling points to me for this series is its intricate structure. This is very much complex, convoluted to some extent, but it's also a really fun ride and it definitely has a very light tone to it. It discusses things such as empire and sexuality. It has a very diverse cast of characters, especially when it comes to sexuality. And there is a polyamorous relationship being built. So that's all I'm gonna say about this one because I've talked about it so many times already this year. Diving into the actual translated works that I'm gonna be reading. First up is a book that I'm actually already starting at this point in time because I did progress through my March TBR a little bit quicker than I thought I was gonna. And so that is Cleopatra by Alberto Ancola. So this is a nonfiction about Cleopatra, Queen of Egypt, and it is going to be looking specifically at a period of 20 years of her reign in which she was very much a world player, a key player in the development of our world history, a key player in developing the way that, for example, the Roman Empire was evolving at that point in time. I don't know a whole lot about Cleopatra. I have somewhat of a resentment towards Cleopatra because people always think that my name comes from Cleopatra when it doesn't, um, but I won't hold that against the actual person Cleopatra. Alberto Angela is an Italian writer. I will be reading the Dutch translation, but in principle I'm actually listening to the English translation of this one. So I've started it, but I'm really not that far into it. It's trying to interweave 
facts with narration, so it's definitely a narrative style of non-fiction writing, and we'll see whether I enjoy that or not. Next up, a book of which I have had the arc for a way too long, so this is my longest overdue arc that I needed to read, and at this point in time I already have it physically, and that is There's No Such Thing as an Easy Job by Kikuku Tsumura. So this is one of the books that I do have in English translation from the Japanese. This is translated by Polly Barton. This one is basically a book about this woman who is sick and tired of her job uh, and she thinks that you know she's tired of putting in so much effort and you know not getting any rewards or something like that and she decides that she wants to go for an easy job a job in which she can just sit around put almost no brain power in it and still coast along and as the title suggests she's gonna go through multiple jobs and figure out that there actually is no such thing as an easy job. Next up, an originally Dutch book. This is Het Huis van de Moskee by Kader Abdullah. I think it's literally translated as The House of the Mosque. Um, Kader Abdullah is an Iranian Dutch author. He is a very prolific author. I think he has quite a lot of books out there already. As the House of the Mosque, as far as I'm aware, is his most well-known work and I think it's also been translated in quite a lot of languages, potentially something like 25 even. Um, this book, I don't really know what it is about. Um, it just says on the back that um, our protagonist has to deal with tensions in society as a result of the um, spiritual or religious leadership becoming more radicalized. I first became interested in this book based on a lecture I had on it in university, but that's been like a long time ago, so I don't really remember any of the reasons why I wanted to pick it up at that time. But in any case, I don't read much Dutch literature and I do at some point want to change that, and so this is a first step towards that. Next up we have a memoir, and that is A Thousand Years of Joys and Sorrow by Ai Weiwei, translated by Alan Barr. So this is a memoir, as I said, Ai Weiwei is a dissident artist, so he basically is no longer welcome in China or under surveillance in China. I don't really fully know for sure whether he is like properly banned now. He definitely in any case has been kept in captivity in China for a hundred days and a lot of his work very much centers around his activism. A topic that's also very prevalent in his work is the refugee crisis for example. Um, a lot of his more modern installations have to do with the refugee crisis. Now he's probably most well known for the birdcage stadium in the Beijing Olympics. But yeah, I think he's a very fascinating figure. I've already watched like a documentary about him and like some of the works that he's created. I When, when there's an exhibit mm -hmm. near me, and by near me I mean like in the UK or in Germany or something like that. I do want, I do usually go there to go and check out his works because I think that he just has very interesting works. And so when I knew that he had written a memoir, I jumped on that. Next up, one of the books that I'm most hesitant about putting on here, or like that I'm most hesitant about what my reaction to it is going to be, is Around the World in Eight Days, AD Days, and Five Weeks in the Bloom by Jules Verne. So this is a French classic. Um, this particular translation is done by... It does not say who is the translator of this specific edition. Um, this is an adventure story. Jules Verne is very much a sort of like adventure and sci-fi writer. Um, but in March, I read another book by Jules Verne, where I tried to read another book by Jules Verne, and I DNF'd it. So I did not finish it, and so I'm a bit hesitant now whether I'm going to enjoy this or not. Um, I'm hoping it's it has less problematic content to begin with, but what's mainly gonna make up my mind is whether it's boring or not. I found the mysterious island to be boring, at least in the first 140 pages, and so I'm hoping that there's more action here or that there's more interesting things happening here. However, it's also about some guy stuck in a hot air balloon, so how fun can you make that? I don't know. We'll see. Hopefully this is a return to Prime for Jules Verne. This is a return to the top contents that I enjoyed in his Journey to the Center of the Earth, for example. Let's dive into the other, not so sure about this one, and that is The Leopard by Giuseppe Tomasi di Lampedusa. So Il Gatto Pardo is the original Italian um, book. This is translated by Archibald Colquhoun. 
never seen that last name and I have no idea which language I even need to use as reference for that pronunciation. I'll have it on the screen. But so this is an Italian classic. It is all about the end of an era. Basically it's about the end of the Sicilian aristocracy and about their final days in that situation I guess. It's about them slowly realizing that the world around them is changing and that these traditions that they've upheld and they and their families have upheld for centuries might be in danger of ending. It might not be possible for them to keep a hold of this type of lifestyle for much longer. But that means it's very much character or atmosphere focused reading which isn't necessarily a problem. I have definitely liked those types of books before but it is always a risk to some extent. I don't always like that. I have seen the movie for this one and I can tell you that there is basically more or less no plot so it's definitely gonna be about whether the writing intrigues me, whether the story, the character work intrigues me or not. I have read really good things about The Leopard but I'm still very hesitant about what my experience is gonna be with this. I'm very much scared that I'm gonna be bored throughout and then I'm going to DNF as a result, which I'll definitely allow myself to do. But I'm still, of course, hoping that I'm going to have the opposite experience with it and that I will love it the way that some of those reviewers have. Next up, another Dutch one, and that is Jij Zegt It by Connie Palman, translated as Your Story, My Story. Um, this is a book about the relationship between Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes. So, um, yeah, apparently there's a lot of abuse in that relationship. I don't know whether it's like, it's probably not sexual abuse, but it's very much emotional abuse. I think so, at least. I think that that is what's happening with, in their relationship. But I could also be wrong about that. But in any case, Sylvia Platt is very well known for having written The Bell Jar, which is a book basically about her dealing with depression. And I'm very interested to see the approach of this book. I'm very interested to see what I'll think of it. I know that in Belgium at least, this is the author is originally Dutch, so from the Netherlands, but in Belgium at least um, it very much was well received and I definitely know people who have read it and who have really loved it, so hopefully that's going to be the same for me. I've never read anything by Colin Palme and so um, hopefully I'm going to enjoy it. Nearing the end we get to The Spy by Paulo Cujo, so this is translated from the Portuguese by Zoe Perry. I don't know much about this one, this one centers around Matahari who is a female spy, but I don't even know in which context I need to place her. Um, and it says at the back her only crime was to be an independent woman. So I, Matahari is a sort of name that I know, I hear floating around and I'm like, I am Matahari, but actually I know nothing about Matahari and so I'm very interested to read this one for that reason. However, I have previously read Paolo Cujo and I really loved him the first time I read him. So I read The Alchemist when I was in high school and I absolutely loved it. Uh, even though it was a required reading, it overcame my prejudices from having to read required reading. I loved it, but then a few years ago, like one or two years ago, I reread it and I didn't like it all that much anymore. It was so spiritual, it was so allegorical, it very much had a lesson to teach you and it very much was clear about that lesson, you know, it wasn't, wasn't, there was nothing subtle about it, let's say it like that, and I really don't care for that type of messaging anymore. And so I'm hoping that because this has a very different premise or that this is going to look at something very different from what the alchemist storyline is that maybe I'm not gonna have that experience with this one but I'm still hesitant. In any case the alchemist still read really quickly in spite of the fact that I just didn't enjoy it all that much anymore but of course I'm hoping for more here. And then the final one is one that I also don't know too much about and this is The Diving Pool by Yoko Ogawa. This is the Dutch translation. This is a collection of three novellas um, and it says here three beautiful novellas that showcase the darker side of love. 
don't know more about that and of course since it's like novellas and the whole thing is still under 160 pages I'm also not going to research much because that's probably just going to spoil the entire thing but so I've read The Housekeeper and the Professor by Yoko Ogawa and so I wanted to read more by her and so a friend of mine was getting rid of this copy and then I was like okay just give it to me Personally, I would have preferred to read The Memory Police next, but this opportunity just came my way and then uh, I wasn't going to refuse it because, you know, I really enjoyed The Housekeeper and the Professor and so hopefully I'll enjoy this one as well. If it doesn't really work out, I'm also not going to hold it against the author because, you know, I do enjoy short stories less than longer formats. So, you know, if this doesn't work out, I'll just still give the memory police to go as well before I you know make a permanent decision about whether I want to continue reading Yoko Akawa's work or not. But so those are the nine translated works plus one extra that I need to read in the month of April. And there is also a potential problem. <laughs> so um, I am signed up for the booktube prize from the beginning of the year already. I signed up for a potential judge for the translated fiction segment of that prize. Now the booktube prize is something that I also participated in in 2019 I guess it was or 2020 maybe. Um, so basically in each round you read six books over the course of two months and so for this year I signed up but I signed up with the intention of only signing up for the final round which is basically the August September round. However this month we received an email saying that there weren't enough judges who had confirmed who had signed up for this round to be able to let the prize continue at the current amount of judging each round and so I last minute added my name to the judging pool and so it is very much possible that I will receive an email on the 1st of April I'm guessing with an assignment to read six books over the next two months which could completely upset my Project Zero CBR, so we'll see. We'll see whether that ends up happening or not. Um, if that ends up happening, I will briefly mention them in my wrap-up, but I will not give you my full thoughts on those books until the round has concluded, so until probably around the 1st of June. So potentially I'm reading more or I'm reading other books than the ones that I've just mentioned. But so yeah, that's my reading plans for this month. Definitely let me know if you know any of these books, what your thoughts are on them, you know, are you interested in any of the books that I've mentioned and like what's the book you're most looking forward to reading in the month of April. For me that will be There's No Such Thing As An Easy Job. Is that the title? <laughs> By Kiko Gutsumura. I've really been wanting to pick this one up for a very long time and so I'm very eager to dive into it this month. But so yeah, with that I'm gonna end this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it and see you guys for the next one. Bye!